Okay, well, nice to see everyone today um, and welcome to the East Kent Economic Development Group, part of the Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce, where we group together uh, generally each other month, every other month, and we share what's going on within the region uh, to cover uh, the Folkestone Hive district over to Dover and to the Thanet district, which then get reported up to the board of the Kent and Victor Chamber, and then in turn, that information is shared uh, within the realms of the authorities and business support networks within Kent and our members. And then further afield, it goes up to BCC, which has very strong engagement with government. So uh, within the, the scope of what we've been doing as a, a board and a chamber, um, it's been quite an incredible time for the chamber overall. Uh, where there's obviously clearly been a lot of membership support that's been required um, and there's been lots surrounding uh, funding to help businesses adapt and change and particularly throughout the COVID situation. Um, lots of businesses of course have had to embed digital into their business uh, way of working and working from home and everything like that and of course the Chamber has been very much involved in that. Um, the Chamber has delivered 116 virtual events in the last year, so it's been very busy, and it's also had over 5,000 people attend those events. Uh, one of the things that the Chamber has been doing, which I think most members will know, but it's the Kent and Medway uh, Growth Hub, and that works very closely with the local authorities, which has delivered a lifeline to businesses, and uh, we've supported over 14,000 uh, business engagement uh, aspects within that particularly surrounding COVID, but of course, dealing with the Brexit uh, situation and the, uh, the chambers have been very much involved in that process and guided businesses and in turn has custom clearances and um, uh, declaration service available as well, done by the VCC. Interestingly enough, we had a, a meeting or uh, rather an, an AGM the other day and the uh, Director General of the VCC uh, mentioned that uh, the, the, the situation where you know it's important that they put information forward to protect jobs, to support cash flow, and to keep the economy moving. There's some very interesting things that came out of that, which you can look on our website. But let's get a bit more local. Um, what I want to do is to share with you the thoughts and aspects that are going on with my uh, board colleagues here today. Um, and I'll just go around the room, as it were, and. Um, we're here to see the uh, name of the business and what they do and what's been going on. So uh, perhaps, first of all, if I may start with uh, Daniel, if that's okay. Hi, morning, Ray and everybody. Um, Daniel San Giuseppe from Castlewood Hotels. Um, it's a family business. We have three hotels in the southeast, um, two of which are in Kent and one in Folkestone, which is part of this um, East Kent patch. Uh, our sector, hospitality, has, um, as everyone knows, taken a big hit in these last 12 months or so. Uh, last time we met was the end of October, and I was saying that we were starting to really see things uh, dropping off, and we were really worried about going into the winter, which is typically a, a, a low season for us anyway, but with all the concerns and all the restrictions, we were really worried about um, you know, cancellations and no business picking up. And we we're really, really worried about Christmas in particular. Uh, December, as people know, is a, a really important month for our sector with Christmas parties, group staying, Christmas Day lunches and all the rest of it. And there was so much concern and trepidation that we didn't know what was going to happen. Lo and behold, the week after we were in national lockdown. Um, and so we had to close our hotels again. Um, and then we were still had hopes that in December we would be able to reopen and damage limitation, get some business through the door in December. But unfortunately, Kent reopened in tier three and then actually in, and then we're up, up into tier four, as everyone knows. So um, that really didn't give us a chance to, to even, even open. Some colleagues uh, did decide to, to stay open just for um, you know, essential work for um, key sector contracts like the NHS and other government uh, business. Um, but we, there wasn't enough demand to, to make it viable for us. We felt we would lose more money being open than being closed. So we decided to, to close the doors. Luckily, the furlough was extended. Um, so we were able to retain uh, the majority of the staff that we had left at that point. 
um, and see what and see where that would take us. Uh, we're now end of January. We're still closed down um, our, our hotels. Other hotels have stayed open, as I say. Some have got bits and pieces, um, but they, it's been a struggle to to make ends meet. Um, some some businesses in our sector have been able to adapt and do things like takeaways and deliveries on the food and drink side. Um, some bars and restaurants have done that as well to stay afloat. But on the whole, it's been really, really tough for, for our industry. We are, at, at this stage, we are not expecting that we're going to be allowed to reopen or at least not be able to open um, with restrictions to actually make it commercially viable to reopen until Easter at the earliest now. So it's all about mitigating our costs, which we still have whilst we're closed. It's about making sure that furlough is extended as long as possible and then flexible furlough when we can reopen. And it's about uh, cash flow, as has been mentioned already, Ray, as you said, at the, at the AGM, it was touched upon. That's key to our businesses. It's all about getting some cash injections. All the other government incentives like the rate relief and VAT reductions and, um, and, and any, anything else, uh, are all helpful when you're trading if the business is coming through the door at this stage when there is no income for a lot of us um, we need cash just to cover our costs so there has been some bits fed to fed down to us and, and our local authority in Folkestone and Hythe has been really supportive to try and make sure that the uh, grants have been fed as quickly as possible to us so that that's been helpful um, and as an industry, we are quite resilient and we're always optimistic and looking positive to, to the future. We do think that there will be um, a bounce back again, as we saw in, in August uh, last year, as soon as we can open with whatever restrictions we have. We're still hopeful that, you know, things like major events that are due in this part of the world, like the, the Open in July, will still go ahead and we can benefit from that and a few other major, major events as well. And, um, and colleagues have been doing their utmost during these tough months. Um, to support um, some lo other local businesses and communities. It, you know, Brexit has been mentioned. Of course, that affects our part of the world very much. So, uh, especially down in Dover and Folkestone and even up to Thanet with all the, um, all the impact we've had with the, with the lorries and the border control measures. So as I say, our, our sector, many of our colleagues helped out when there, were, when there was all the stack going on to feed um, some of the drivers that were there and to accommodate where possible. And as I say, looking forward, we really are hopeful that another staycation effect will take place and we can retain our staff as long as possible and that we hope more measures will, will, will happen after we reopen to incentivize uh, people to, uh, to, to basically spend their money locally and, uh, and come and visit the, the local hospitality businesses. Because I can't see too much um, incoming business from outside of the UK straight away this year with all the, uh, the Brexit situation going on, maybe later on down the line, but certainly not, not initially. So it's all gonna be about domestic business uh, for, for this year. Okay, and Daniel, that's great. So, um, well, following on with the transport theme there, Matthew, you okay to come in? Yeah, morning, everyone. Uh, Matthew Arnold from Stagecoach. Um, so really, my update is going to be in two parts. The first is, is about um, COVID and um, we're obviously not immune to what's going on in the world. Um, currently, passenger numbers are about 20% of where we'd expect them to be. Um, and as of uh, the beginning of this week, we're running about 75% of uh, the mileage that we'd expect to operate. So um, there's clearly a huge disconnect there between uh, cost and revenue, which fortunately for us is at the moment being underwritten by central government. So we're being brought back to a net zero position um, and that's likely to continue until at least um, the, uh, the lockdown uh, and social distancing rules are relaxed. Um, we have been running at about uh, at 100% of, uh, of operated mileage from September in order to uh, cope with schools going back and the social distancing requirements around um, uh, the carriage of school children. Um, but of course, since schools have been shut again, um, the demand's fallen off. Um, the, the changes we made um, this week were based largely on what we did last summer and was quite a well-honed plan 
um, bearing in mind no one had ever done this before and we were trying to make decisions on the basis of either very unreliable or no data at all. Um, and actually this week, um, Kimberly uh, from Discovery Park got in touch with me and said that there was an issue with some, uh, some Pfizer employees who were trying to come through from Canterbury. So we were able to uh, make some adjustments to, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, just a, an, an open offer to anyone really, if anyone picks up something that has gone wrong, Bearing in mind we had to do this very quickly, we were given about 10 days notice by the Department of Transport to, um, to, to bring this in. We weren't able to do the amount of consultation that we'd normally do. So if anyone's uh, picked up anything that's gone horribly wrong, please just drop us a note. Okay. The um, second part of the update really is about, um, is about Brexit and the disruption that we all saw um, before Christmas and for us, um, that was quite catastrophic um, because it covered Thanet. We had huge disruption around Manston. The Thanet Way was closed for a while because of a demonstration by truck drivers who felt that they were being imprisoned. Um, we had uh, actually some other difficulties in the uh, Manston area. There was a fallen tree, I think, and a first water main as well while all this was going on. So. Poor old people in Minster and Moncton uh, didn't see a bus for a couple of days. Um, there were two strands of disruption. So we had um, the, 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 the key disruption leading just up to Christmas, which was so heavily publicised. Um, and, and actually, we could, we could break that down into... Um, one or two issues that weren't dealt with, but had been discussed in many, many forums leading up to um, uh, our, our leaving the European Union finally um, at the end of December. So the, the issue for us was that while trucks were being directed to Manston, uh, there was no enforcement. So if you think of your average you know, Bulgarian truck driver who doesn't perhaps speak English as his first language, at Junction 7, he's given a set of directions to get to Manston and off you go uh, across the A249 and onto the M2 and you get to Brenly Corner. Uh, and you might think, well, hang on a minute, Dover's only 20 miles that way, but they're asking me to go another 20 miles out of my way in order to go another 30 miles back to Dover. So quite a few of them actually came off at Brenny Corner and went down the A2. The net result of that was the A2 backed up progressively all the way back until it was past Lydon Lights, which is quite con some considerable distance from the docks. Um, once we'd gone through uh, Lydon Lights, it was impossible for us to operate buses between um, Canterbury and Dover. Um, and uh, then trucks started to run down the old road into Dover and ended up blocking up the Dover one-way system. And in fact, what happened was as Dover started to clear, uh, there were trucks and light vans that had simply been abandoned and were parked in live carriageways with no drivers because they were down at the docks or trying to find food or whatever. So Dover was an absolute nightmare and we pleaded and pleaded and pleaded uh, for some kind of enforcement at Brenly Corner to stop trucks from using the A2, but it never happened. Okay. Um, if, if you wind back a few days, so the week before we'd had um, the last of the stockpiling um, and trucks trying to get back, um, ha having bought uh, stockpiling into the UK, uh, we had uh, Dover Tap, which filled up very quickly and then Highways England introduced a new, uh, tra a new traffic management plan, which, as far as I can see, hasn't been discussed with anyone, um, which was to close the Round Hill tunnels. And when that happened, everything just piled through Folkestone and brought Folkestone to a grinding halt. Um, uh, and we made the strongest representations possible to um, Highways England through our local MPs because that was absolutely disgraceful. I'm sure it was a political decision to make sure that we didn't bring Operation Stack or Brock in until we absolutely had to, but um, that, that would have been 
that was the uh, result of the disruption that you all saw just before uh, Christmas. So we're working through some of those problems to make sure if, if we're in that situation again, that, um, that Dover is kept clear, that, that Dover town is kept clear, and that there are no nasty surprises on the M20 and A20. Okay, oh, that was a bit of a ramble. That's it from me. No, no, that's fine. It's good, to, good to know. So that's great. Um, uh, Jonathan, can you come in? I know uh, Jonathan, incidentally, is going to be uh, giving us some more information. He's going to be doing a presentation after this gathering. So uh, if we can just try and keep it to a couple of minutes, it'd be great each time. Yeah, um, I mean, most of it will be covered off in the presentation. Um, you'd obviously see what's happening with education within the news. We had a meeting yesterday and. Uh, for secondary schools and colleges we're looking like after easter that we'll reopen other than to the vulnerable students so um yeah that's really the big the big thing for us in terms of covid and yeah i'll cover the rest off with the presentation later okay jonathan and uh, lee are you okay to come in yeah that's fine thank you ray um i just very briefly from a as it were a sector update i mean uh, my name is Lee May and I'm a partner of Bracious Solicitors. So uh, within the legal sector, obviously, we're a, a professional support service. So we're not as directly affected as a lot of frontline workers. Um, but I think that the work that we do is perhaps a good indication of, of where the economy is locally. Um, and um, it's not been too bad from, from our perspective. Um, yeah, the uh, corporate transactions are still taking place. Property transactions are still taking place. Um, our residential conveyancing team is obviously very busy at the moment uh, because of the uh, stamp duty holiday, which ends, I think, in um, in March. Um, and then also from a, from an employment team point of view, um, we're busy um, and on the private client side uh, too. So, I mean, there has been an impact, but it's not been as as bad as it has been for a lot of frontline businesses. For example, uh, for in, in the hospitality sector. In terms of our COVID response, um, we've got four offices. Uh, they're all closed to the public at the moment, um, and we're maintaining a, a skeleton crew in those offices to deal with um, you know, those meetings that do have to take place, and also to deal with uh, incoming post, for example. Um, uh, for example, I'm I'm in our Canterbury office today, and it's just me. Um, we. Um, in order to uh, keep on top of the COVID situation, we have regular business continuity planning meetings weekly um, to, to monitor the situation and to disseminate information to the staff. And I think that's an important feature of what we're doing is, is being very open and transparent with the staff about what the, what the situation is and, and providing them with as much information as we can. And that includes through uh, weekly updates from our uh, managing partner, Joe Warby, uh, there's a real focus internally on making sure that people's mental health is is at the forefront. Um, obviously, with everybody working at home, it can be a pretty isolating experience. So we make sure we have regular team meetings, uh, you know, weekly team meetings, and also more frequently than that, if, if necessary, uh, just to make sure that everybody's uh, kept in contact and feels part of, a, of an ongoing team. Um, if people do want to come into the office, we, we encourage them to have the lateral flow tests as well, just to, as, a, as part of our COVID response, uh, just to make sure that, that um, contact in the office doesn't operate as, a, as a, a, a point of transmission for the virus. So, yeah, that's probably it, really. Uh, still quite busy and trying to keep on top of our COVID response. OK, thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, still quite crazy times for everyone to actually hear somebody say that, you know, on video is kind of bizarre to, to think, you know, where we are in this situation. But uh, onwards and upwards, let's uh, hope we come out the other side of it. But there are measures you have to take place. Uh, incidentally, Lee, how many would you normally have had within your, well, perhaps your Maidstone office is probably acting the same, is it, the, the head office? Uh, well, as a, as a firm, we have, I think it's in excess of 200 staff now. And I think across the whole organisation, across the four buildings, there's probably no more than 20 people in at, at any one time and often fewer. Yeah. OK, well, perhaps a, another time we talk more in depth about the changes that are going on in that respect. So uh, and perhaps similarly over to Mike. Is, are you OK, Mike? Absolutely. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, Mike Marsh, I'm the area manager for the East Kent business team, Barclays Business. Barclays Bank, sorry. So, yeah, it's been a... Been a pretty mad year uh, last 11 12 months with 
supported and we spoke to more businesses I think in the last 12 months than, than, than we have had before it's been, which has been great um, quite um, quite tough to listen to someone like Daniel who's you know, been impacted in, in the way that he has and, and uh, you know there's plenty of stories like that that, that we're you know, trying to support them whichever way we can I think so the last 12 well, yeah, 10, 11 months since civil scheme has been available we've, we've been about we're just over £9 million to, to the local area so this the, the East Kent area, we've done over £27 million of bounce back, bounce back loans as well, as, as well as £7 million of, of BAU, uh, yeah, commercial mortgages or, or yeah, property purchases or whatever that might be. So, you know, typically we'd, we'd probably lend about 9 or £10 million across the calendar year. And uh, so it's been, a, it's been a pretty manic year supporting all those clients. We're kind of probably the other side of that now, just trying to, speak to as many clients as we can, as often as we can, just offer support in, you know, how we, how we might be able to, so it's difficult. I think lo- locally or across the sector, I think it's in HSBC have announced that they're closing two branches, so they're closing Deal and Ramsgate in this area. Uh, no, no other closures from, from any of the banks that, that I've seen, but they, I think that was announced last week, so something to be mindful of. Um, but no, I think o- overall, speaking to clients now, the, you know, it's, it's, it is getting it is getting really tough. The continued lockdown. I think we're not too far away from having to start repaying those bounce back loans and civils civils loans, and you know that's a big worry. The the, the support or that you know the government have announced that you can increase that to you know those repayments across to ten years. That is a you know that's not a standard thing. That is a, a last last chance saloon type type offer. So you know there's going to be some difficult times. I think. British Business Bank have quoted anything between 30% and 50% of bad debt from all the bills and, and civils that have been been offered. So you know, that's going to it's going to be tough when businesses, you know, when fellow scheme ends, like Daniel mentioned, and and those loans need to be start being repaid. I think it's going to be a really tough few months ahead. Um, but yeah. you know, overall, we we are open for business and 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 we are there to support clients where, wherever we can or, or non clients for that matter. So. Um, but yeah, that's a, a quick overview of the sector, I think. Okay, thanks, Mike. Good and break. yeah, cheers. And Catherine, are you able to come in? Good. You're on mute, Catherine, if you're okay. You're on mute, yeah. <laughs> no, you sit on mute, Catherine. I'm oh, sorry. All right. Yeah. Can, can um, you, sorry, Catherine, can you introduce yourself? Because we couldn't yeah. hear. Yeah, Absolutely. Please. So I'm I'm Catherine Harvey from Folks in the High District Council. Sorry, I can't change my title no, on okay. this slide. That we, we did that happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm sort of speaking on behalf of the local authorities, really, in the sense that uh, we've all been pretty much over the last probably about the last seven or eight months uh, distributing the government COVID grants to businesses. So, for example, we've had a discretionary business grant scheme in the summer. Um, we in Folkestone and Hyder had around £1.2 million at that time we had to distribute. And uh, we did that successfully. I think we had about uh, a few thousand left at the end of it, which uh, we felt was very good. 99% uh, distribution rate, which is great. We gave grants at that time to about 161 of our local businesses. Since November, we've had to administer a new grant scheme, the Additional Restrictions Grant. Uh, We, as an authority, have had much more given to us for that, so £3.2 million. Uh, And that is in addition to the Local Restriction Support Grant, LSRG, as we call it, um, LRSG, all these acronyms, um, which has been administered by our business rates team. That one, the LSRG, is for businesses in business rated premises, whereas our, the additional restrictions grant is a discretionary grant scheme, which is open to businesses that fall outside of the rate system and are also, um, we are making it eligible to home based businesses as well. Businesses that are in shared premises often don't have to pay, pay business rates directly, so they would get the grants through us. Uh, we've got roughly in folks in Hyde around three million pounds to uh, to distribute, three point two million pounds. Lots of money. So far, we've given out grants uh, worth about forty three percent of that total. 
we have got next financial year in which to spend that money and a chunk of it and the government has indicated up to 20 percent of our three million could be spent on business support programs uh, in the coming year rather than just be given as grants so considerable amount of money available for business support uh, we are very conscious and uh, certainly the message that came from our business advisory board last week was that um, you know we are we're very aware that actually the impact of this pandemic may not be yet felt by many businesses and it may be in the summer or towards the autumn that uh, businesses start to really feel a pinch so we want to make sure we still have some money retained so that we can help those businesses particularly the key businesses in our area which we really wouldn't want to to see faltering so it's sort of a bit of a balancing act. We want to give out as much as we can to help businesses now that are in dire straits, but also have an eye to the future as well. Um, other things that we are managing to do as a team that I just sort of wanted to report, report on. Obviously, for us, it's sort of trying to manage the grant schemes in addition to business as usual. Um, so just to, to report on a few things, uh, just to mention talking about location. Yeah, we as a council, all of our our workers are, are working from home um, and a decision has been taken that we will not in our in current form uh, return to the civic centre and we're looking at options for that site for the future. Uh, that was a decision taken by our cabinet just, uh, just last week. Uh, we're looking at potentially having a new much smaller building uh, as part of the Otterpool Park development near Junction 20 but also having smaller customer access points within the town centre. So I really can't see us going back, working from the council offices as we previously were um, in any form really uh, in the future. Maybe there'd be the frontline staff accessible to the public, but the rest of the back office workers, which perhaps includes me, um, are more likely to be, to be work, continuing to work from home. So that's a, a significant change for us. Other things that we've been doing um, and that I wanted to draw your attention to, we still have the Folkestone Community Work CLLD programme operating, as Daniel will know and testify, he's on our, our LAG, our Local Action Group Board. Um, we do have SME business grants available to businesses through that programme uh, for businesses in the central uh, Folkestone area. So I just wanted to sort of flag that for everyone. We're going to have an open call so if there's any businesses around on this call that want to apply for some money to help with growth in the future or even to mitigate the impacts of, uh, of COVID, then please look at that, that, that programme. Uh, part of one of the projects that have come forward through that programme has been the refurbishment of 16 Boovery Place uh, just near Burger King. Uh, near the bus station in Folkestone and we're very pleased that that's going to come available for, for businesses. There will be flexible office space there, uh, ability to be able to use that space together with other space elsewhere across the uh, portfolio of the East Kent Spatial Development Company who have, have brought that forward. So we're very excited with that. We're also very pleased with the progress that's been made at our employment hub in Mountfield Road uh, in New Romney. Remember, this is a, a project that um, we've had funding from the Magnox Socioeconomic Fund to develop, as well as funding from the East Kent Spatial Development Company and ourselves as a, as a council. We were very fortunate in bringing forward the second stage to that project to release further employment land. Uh, and we were successful in getting 3 point million from the Getting Building Fund for that. So that work is also about to start as well. So some positive news on what's happening around the district. OK, well, thank you, Catherine. And uh, I know I was at a meeting last week and rightly so, you know, you say that you're working in the background. But to me, you're one of the front line, you know, sort of colleagues in that you're really helping support business. So. You know, if you can pass back our thanks from this group back to the council. And, you know, I think uh, Folks and Hive District is actually at the forefront. So congratulations. You're doing some great stuff, uh, notwithstanding the other districts. But, you know, it is good stuff. And, the, and I really do get genuine, very good, positive responses back from the businesses on the street. So, you know, uh, it's all good stuff going on. So thank you for that. So um, carrying on. Steve, are you available? Yeah. 
Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Ray. Hi everyone. Uh, so Steve Wisby, Managing Director of NIC Instruments. We're based in Folkestone and we are a manufacturer of bomb disposal equipment. Uh, so just thinking about how last year went, yeah, there was a downturn in business. Uh, we took advantage of the furlough scheme and all the various government stuff. And that all, I was always actually quite impressed how quickly all the stuff from the government kicked in, how easy it was to do and how supportive the banks were, which is an expression I never actually thought I would ever use in my life. Um, Although they had a downturn in business as government bodies shut down and stopped doing purchasing, towards the end of the year, we did win a couple of nice, big, profitable orders, which we delivered at the, before the end of last year. And they were really good shot in the arms to, to make a little bit of a recovery. Uh, and we're also fortunate to go into the beginning of this year with quite a nice order book and very close to securing several very large contracts. So actually, this year at the moment seems to be looking really good for us. Um, yes. We, as an exporter, we're 100% export. We don't sell anything to the UK. So we are absolutely feeling the impacts of leaving the EU. We export 50%, about 50% of what we export is outside the EU. So we're actually quite skilled at exporting outside the EU. So we're basically applying the same rules that we export to those countries now to the EU. So we have all the right paperwork. We know how to do the paperwork, the documentation, create the invoices with the right um, terminology on and things like that. The problem we're seeing though is the couriers are making them are making a lot of mistakes so some couriers like fedex they're very good at it no issues but one courier in particular that we deal with dpd they are really screwing it up big time and it's their systems not being in place that are really causing the issues um, as an example uh, we delivered some goods to our customer in germany he would have to pay the vat on the import but because DPD delivered it into a Netherlands port, he had to pay VAT in the Netherlands. He's not registered in the Netherlands, so he couldn't pay that. So that consignment, I think, is currently on its way back to us. Uh, and I think we have another consignment that was going into Germany, again, not based because the courier was making mistakes, uh, is also on its way back to us. So um, right now, in terms of business, manufacturing, OK. Uh, the impact of Brexit is very significant for us as an exporter. Uh, in terms of COVID, we've got quite a big factory and not a huge amount of staff, so we're able to keep the distancing. Obviously, our guys can't work from home because they have to run machinery. Um, and we had a small outbreak. Well, we did have an outbreak of COVID. We had to shut the factory for a couple of days last year. But we have all the distancing in place and the hand washing and the face mask, all the usual stuff, nothing, nothing different to what anyone else is doing. Uh, and we seem to be managing OK at the moment. So that's it, really. Great. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And uh, obviously trials and tribulations again within the manufacturing side, but uh, good luck moving forward. Uh, Cherie, are you, are you okay? Hi, good morning, everybody. Cherie, Business Development Manager for, of uh, Martello Building Consultancy. Um, those who don't know, we offer uh, planning, um, architectural technical packages, contract administration, uh, CDM principal design, etc. We're based in Folkestone. Um, we've been very, very fortunate, um, obviously, because we're part of, like Lee said, the property um, sector and construction sector seems to be really going strong. Um, there are obviously, with most of us, um, quite a bit, uh, quite a few challenges that we have to uh, try and work with, like everybody here has been saying, um, lots of um, trying to sort of adapt uh, throughout the since last year really and every time as we know when you think things are looking better um you know just need to sort of go back to the drawing board um so i think like for most of us you know resilience is is key um adaptability as i said and um perseverance we've been um uh, sort of really busy with private and uh, public sector works um we're focused in uh, council, folks in High District Council, um, very pleased to say, as uh, uh, Catherine reiterated earlier, about Mountfield's business hub that we were managed to start the project in January um, and it's going really, it's going well. And then also with Dover Council, we've uh, finished uh, Folkestone Road, um, the eight self contained flats uh, for interim uh, housing, and we're working on uh, several other. Uh, affordable housing with the uh, Dover Council as well. So yes, we're really pleased. In terms of COVID and and our uh, work setup, we've had to send some of our, um, well, most of us are working from home 
And I don't really need to say how challenging that is, especially if you've got children, you know, no, no school, homeschooling. Um, so some of our colleagues have had to work on reduced hours, which increase the workload um, on other colleagues. So yes, yeah, so, but I suppose this is just all part and parcel of, you know, working in these times. And I think we'll come out stronger with regards to the chamber. The chamber has been brilliant. Ray, you mentioned a lifeline, they have been. And I think we've, in, in this, these times, we've actually made stronger contacts and built stronger relationships because, you know, we are all going through pretty much the same thing on a daily basis, whether it's work or life. We've got to adapt, we've got to work together um, and, and work on plans. And then um, I also just want to thank folks in the Higher District Council for really being probably, you know, not a bit so dynamic um, in every sense, whether it's the folks in the Hive Place campaign, which we've definitely seen um, had an impact on our property uh, sales over here, you know, people moving from London um, and hopefully starting up, you know, businesses uh, soon from, from here as well. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Cherie. Um, Kimberly, are you there? You, can you come in? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. How, how are you? Are you all right? Yes, we're good. How yeah, are you? Lovely. Very interesting conversations. Excellent. Are you able to give us an update, Kimberly, especially in your arena within the medical pharmaceutical and everything that's happening over your way? Yeah, I can give you an update. I'll keep it as brief because um, I know your timelines. But yeah, COVID wise, um, we're pretty much there. Our health and safety people are doing everything they can to get tenants on site when they want to. So we're going to be starting testing on site. And so and this is in Sam Sandwich, Kimberly, if you can just say where you're from, sorry, because just sorry, I'm out. Kimberly Anderson at Discovery Park. So this is the sandwich site, um, Discovery Park. So yeah, we're going to be putting in testing for people that come on site so that everyone knows everyone's safe. At the moment, you drive in, you have to have a mask on and you, you can't touch banisters, spritzed as soon as you go into the facilities, if you know what I mean. So everything is pretty much um, in place. A lot of tenants are choosing to work from home, but there's always, I'd say for the 160 tenants, there's quite a lot of them that want to be in the office. So we have to make it as safe as possible. And that's what we're doing. So we're um, basically for the Discovery Park management team, we've got our own offices. I'm in the head office with other three people. So I am going in because I'm called a frontline worker. Um, I go in in the afternoons mainly after Zoom meetings and we stay away from anyone else who's in operations because obviously operations have to walk around. They have to make sure the gases are coming through. They have to make sure the water, water treatment plant is working, et cetera, et cetera. And tenants have what they want and they even need food. So we all have to keep away from those people that are working around and they have their own office and then they, they will be getting tests. So we're keeping the place going. And as you've all said today, the same words, very hard to do that but everything is in place to keep businesses going if they wish to be on site and this testing system will be um, vital obviously we have run healthcare on site they are doing testings anyway privately i'm working with them with the education side of things they asked for advice to test the kids that were going back to schools Obviously, they went back for one day and then lockdown. So that is in um, that project is there. The help is there from the people that are working on site. So COVID and health and safety is in place. The other going into inquiries and how we're doing as a business with, you know, selling space, keeping tenants, encouraging people to come on site. It's quite busy at the moment. You've probably heard the word Pfizer quite a lot at the moment. So that makes us quite busy, that it's a quite an attractive site. Even a five-year-old would probably know the word Pfizer at the moment. Got a lot 
of tenants on site that have been working with Belgium and across the world um, on this vaccination scheme and the variant, we have to keep them safe. They have to be com coming in to do their R&D to feed um, everybody else. So that's why we're being extra careful with Pfizer and what their needs are. And I have to say actually to Matthew, thank you so much because with these the problems that Matthews faced with the, the bus services, it was getting really difficult because we're trying to get people in that perhaps are PhD students in Canterbury, they don't have a car. And I have to say, Matthew just pulled out all the stops to get key workers on site. So I thank Matthew for that. And it will also help other tenants to be fair. Um, but Matthew didn't pause for a second, he just sorted it. So thank you, Matthew. The other going forward and the other things we are looking at, um, you probably know, I already have spoken to you about the white paper, Ray, and I'm, I'll leave all that to Jonathan. Um, the skills for jobs and what we're doing on site with skills is quite intense. So we're going from private, primary right through to HE. Again, I'll leave that with Jonathan because he kind of leads that with me. And also we're looking at the bids, the strength and places, which I can share that with you. It has gone out on a press release. So you will understand how important that is, even more important right now, because we're looking at the digital, the AI, and how we can introduce medicines a lot quicker. And this funding is quite immense. So we're massively working on those bids at the moment, and that will be a game changer. So the design, uh, the digital, digital design studio will be huge for not only Pfizer, but our other scientists and bringing people to the local area. And also another actually reference to Matthew is the logistics of the site. So when we're working in all sorts of ways, so um, as Daniel talks about, we work very closely on the 149th golf championship, festivals, community events. And one of the phrases that I'm using at the moment is we're getting ready. So the site is going to be used for all of the above. And it's also, we are working quite hard with um, central government in the sense of could trucks perhaps be on site testing on site obviously I work with Operation Brock as you know at Manston and etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a lot going on right now so we're kind of firefighting but in a way we have solutions to problems so that's what we're doing at the moment and I, I love that expression from Catherine which is the resilience and the positivity and that's what we we are absolutely um, making happen. So yes, I do go in the office and I've got a bone to pick with Jonathan actually, because I have met up with him <laughs> between all this, because we're trying our hardest to get things over the line and Jonathan will explain that later. And also okay. one, one thing to put on for next meeting, perhaps uh, obviously Freeports has gone um, now, hasn't it, um, for our area. And that might be something to bring up because that what that's what we're putting into a lot of our strategies going forward, our skills aims, and that at the moment is not going to happen. So that might be something that we all need to talk about as well. Yeah, okay, to okay. tip it down. Oh, and the other thing before we go is travel lodge will be completed by the end of March, and I think that might be helpful when we talk about the aqua park. Um, coming locally and all of that, I think that will help to bring people into the area and there's somewhere to stay locally because we don't have any of that in Sandwich, to be fair. Daniel, you could probably help with that. <laughs> OK, well, thank okay, you, Kimberly. Me. Yeah, and it's uh, quite incredible to think, you know, we're all dealing with this COVID situation and some of that, it, you know, is being dealt with, as it were, via via you know uh, discovery park on our doorstep so good luck to you guys and you know past... <laughs> well, we haven't stopped that's for no. sure and, and i am aware that you guys within your sector or your colleagues that work at that site have been working around the clock as well so 
you know, yeah. I think it might be fitting just to pass on our regards to them and say thanks for all the stuff you're doing because it's all very important to help us all get out of this mess, really. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's got crazy times, but I think it's amazing working on a site like that because as I've given you different kind of areas that we work in, whether it's property development, whether it's bringing people in for the economy, whether it's saving lives, you know, through all our lovely scientists, whether it's our skills agenda, it's it's pretty full on on that yeah, side. Absolutely, very diverse. So, yeah, OK, and Kimberly, thanks for that. So, um, Karen, I know you're there, um, but did you just want to give us a wave or did you want to say anything? <laughs> hello. <laughs> no, I don't need to say anything except for uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> I didn't, didn't want to ignore Karen because no. she does all of our minutes for those that are watching. So uh, we come on to Joe, if we can, Joe. Morning, everyone. Um, I do apologise because I'm expecting a call from the school, so it's going to be um, as usual. It will happen when I'm trying to. No, give don't it. worry. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to give, I guess, a couple of updates on what's happening at Locating Kent, which might be of interest and relevance to the team here. Um, we are working on supporting growing businesses in Kent through the Future Forward programme, um, and we ran that. Um, in October last year and it's run again um, and launching with the support of Kent HR and Braciers this time. Um, so this is providing tw targeted 12 hours of support across a number of modules um, and um, kind of really helping I guess like focusing people's attention in, in terms of like what growth um, like what we can support with their growth. Um, I haven't got figures on the kind of the East Kent companies that we're working with, but I'm trying to get hold of that so that when I come back next time, I can talk to you about that. Um, and I think I know everyone on here, but I work at Locating Kent, which is the Inward Investment Agency for Kent. So we help um, companies to land and to grow in Kent. We're working also on the Inward Investment side of things. So um, bringing companies from London and beyond we launched a soft landing package to incentivize the easy landing of companies, again, with um, support of companies like Bracias, um, and we're seeing quite a lot of interest in that. So, you know, it's positive in that respect um, of companies still being interested in Kent, of the great offer that we have, and um, that at the moment we're kind of there's obviously kind of the bad news around um, COVID and kind of the, the optics in terms of kind of the Kent strain and so on, but we're not seeing an impact in terms of um, the interest that's been coming in. Um, and um, you know, at a strategic level, my CEO is working very closely with um, Kent County Council um, and you know, other stakeholders group, groups in terms of our collective response. Um, and we also are working with organizations like Visit Kent, Producing Kent, um, in terms of like kind of how the message of Kent and kind of gets gets through, um, we've um, Catherine touched on the flexible space. At, um, I think at Boobery Place, um, and this is a growing sector in Kent. So um, we work with a number of operators and um, developers who are looking to grow the this, this area in Kent. Um, there's a great opportunity in terms of um, commuters not returning to London. Um, but um, working part time from from their home, from well from near home, um, and working locally, and also companies um, like corporates who are looking to maybe have hubs as well. Um, so they might be based in London or further afield, and then instead of having a big footprint in London, are reducing it or changing kind of how that workspace is used. Um, so that then there might be hubs um, locally. So kind of a, people might have heard of the hub and spoke model. So we're working with you know, a number of organizations who, who are interested in that. Um, and um, we're, we've got 13 operators and investors that we're speaking to about um, opening co-working and flexible working spaces in Kent, in addition to the sites that are already growing. Um, couple of other updates. So I'm just gonna go back to my notes. Um, I mentioned the London market, so we're targeting that on the, um, like through our digital campaigns at the moment. We spoke at the Kent and Medway Business Summit recently, and there's, um, it's going to be quite useful just to have a look at the videos um, that come out of that. That was completely online. We had some great speakers. Um, so when that link comes available, 
then um, I'll share that with you as well. So you can, if you didn't um, manage to access it, uh, there's some useful updates on what's happening across Kent and some workshops. Um, and there's a couple of events to draw to your attention. For example, um, a garden communities conference, which Catherine, I guess that you're probably aware of, I think Othpool are presenting, that may, might be of um, interest to the wider East Kent um, group here. Okay, Joe. thanks for that. And uh, I think we've uh, covered everyone. And just before we come over to Jonathan in a few moments, obviously we covered a lot of ground. So thank you for your uh, feedback and input, really appreciated. Um, it's very interesting where um, I was looking through some notes from a webinar that we did with the Chamber back in March um, that I was actually hosting. And at that time, we was talking about to be prepared for, you know, we were in a lockdown, lockdown one at that time, to, but to be prepared for lockdown four, which I hope would never come and hopefully it won't. But, uh, you know, it's quite amazing to think that we're still in this mess, but hopefully we will come out of it. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very trial, very much a trial for lots of businesses. And, uh, you know, I think, um, uh, I think somebody was saying earlier about that there's more difficulty to come. And I think we have to be realistic when the furlough scheme eventually finishes, hopefully it'll be extended. But when it does, I think there will be some more rep uh, repercussions then inevitably, but we just need to prepare as businesses as best we can. I think something that I've touched on because uh, as it goes, I, I, I'm an NHS responder. So I've been talking to lots of people from home that are in lockdown, but I think it's important not to forget yourselves, uh, not just in this group, people that are listening, whether you are a CEO, a director, or on the uh, management group, don't forget yourselves and your other colleagues because quite often they're looking at employees but are not looking at themselves. So just try and give a bit of thought or process in that by talking together. And I think that's quite a good thing from the mental health part, just, just a little thought there. Um, check out the business grants and all the things that are available. Talk to your bank like Mike was, Mike was saying earlier, you know, it's important to keep engaged don't just leave things at the last minute. I'm not suggesting that is the case, but I have seen a bit of that. Um, but I think one of the most important things, that, again, reflecting back on a year ago, I actually mentioned is to communicate to clients. The people or the businesses that communicate with their clients and continue to do so on a regular basis are going to be the winners in the long term. Uh, it's quite surprising. And even now, where there has been a lack of communication of some businesses or people that I deal with, uh, compared to other in the competition. So just keep in touch with clients, see how they're doing, if there's anything you can help them with. I think it's all quite very important to reach out that kind of process. So not just your staff, employees and contacts, your staff, uh, sorry, your customers. So just a thought, I'm, I'm no expert, but it's just things that can sometimes be forgotten. And it's not intentional because everyone's got enough on their plate. But if you're in business within the Kent community, the uh, Kent Medway community, those businesses would be the ones that I think will come out better in the longer term. So, um, so without further ado, if I may, we're going to move over to Jonathan, who's going to give us an update. And if you can just refresh us, Jonathan, where you're from for our listeners, that'd be very helpful. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, so Jonathan Smith, I'm the Director of Partnerships at EKC Group, family of six colleges. So that includes Canterbury, Sheppey, Broadstairs, Folkestone, and we've just taken over Ashford College as well, which was challenging in lockdown. Um, in terms of education, it's, you know, we're as busy as everyone else in, in terms of what's happening with the government. All our colleges are closed at the moment. We currently open to just vulnerable students and majority of staff are working from home. So we're in that sort of lockdown phase. <clears throat> in terms of support for business, we have our recovery group arm that's looking at apprenticeships, which are actually doing really well this year, better than we anticipated. And I think that's a real, um, uh, really good thing for businesses because I think they're real jobs rather than just added in added value stuff so that's been really positive we've been working a lot of bids so support uh, strength in places bid and also working on the Freeports bid as well to help local businesses so that sort of stuff's been really positive <coughs> excuse me um, one of the main things we've been doing is obviously the kickstart scheme a lot of you might have heard the update from the Chancellor, I think on Monday. So there's obviously some policy changes around that. But essentially, kickstarts to help people who have recently been made unemployed through the Job Centre 
um, support them back into businesses and we've partnered with the chamber north kent college and mid kent college to make sure that we built a a consortium that could deliver some real high quality training um and I think to date we've had about 650 businesses register for that, which has been really positive. Obviously, in the background, there has been policy changes, um, which we've most all read. We're fully committed, so the other two colleges, to continue with the Chamber to make sure that we push through for this. Um, but we've just got to recognise that there are some policy changes in the background as well. Um, it has slightly been slow in Kent. I don't think we've had anyone start on the Kickstart scheme. And that's nothing to do really with the chamber or all the colleges. It's just really the backlog that's happened at JCP, um, trying to recruit staff to sort of help with that. That workload has been quite tough for them. And I think also, I think when the government envisaged this program, it wasn't going to be delivered inside of a, a national lockdown as well. So I think that's also been a problem with that. But in terms of the partnership now, it's ready to go and, and push forward for the support and businesses. The other big point that's come across there was a white paper that was um, uh, given out by government last Friday an 80 page document which we've all been digesting over the last few days about what the impact is um, some fundamental changes to FE and HE and what will come over the next sort of five to ten years um, the government's drive now is to put employers at the centre of post 16 skills which is a really positive thing um, really making sure technical education is on par with A levels and ensuring the industry does have a pathway of skilled young people through to them. So there's going to be changes in funding, there's going to be changes with the support for teaching as well. So some big changes for us in, in terms of education. And I think things like BTEX and that, what we deliver at the moment, will be phased out and it will be a, an employer focused curriculum. So a bit more like the apprenticeship standards um, really focusing on employees working with us and sort of government boards to make sure that we are delivering the skills for that. So some really positive stuff around that. One of the key things that's come out of that is the T levels. And I just wanted to share a presentation with you quickly so it sort of highlights where we're going with this. Um, if I just share my screen. Oh, Ray, you've, oh, you need to let me host. Hi, Jonathan. Um, just give me a second. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's all right. So in terms of T-levels, while well, we're just hosting that, this is um, something that the government has been talking about for the last couple of years. And as I said before, it's... Um, here we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. Can everyone see T levels for employers now? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, John. Yeah, brilliant. <clears throat> so the government's been talking about uh, T levels for the last couple of years about how that will um, work for employers and how that will work for um, education in terms of FE as well. Um, essentially, it's going to be a two year qualification for 16 to 18 year olds. Um, it will be on par with A levels. We are the government is very keen to look at the or replicate this or the German model, the technical educational model. So you know, if you're an engineer, um, you, you, you're regarded in the same esteem as somebody who's been through university and and become a doctor. So real clear pathways now around uh, technical qualifications that are relevant to industry as well. Um, the theory behind it is very much around the apprenticeship standards. So any of you who have had apprentices and the standards around that, essentially it's the same. It is a slight flip. So apprentices are generally in the workplace for 80% of their time and then 20% off the job training. T levels will be the other way. So it'd be 20% Within the, with the employer and then 80% with the uh, with the training provider as a whole. So a real industry placement for these young people and, and a, real, a real good opportunity for employers to have talented young people in there. This next slide really shows where T levels will sit. Um, so as, you, as I said, you know, the parity there is with A levels. Um, they will lead on to higher education, higher apprenticeships, and obviously uh, intermediate apprenticeships as well around sort of the, the key industry drivers that the government is going to be putting through on the white paper. 
These are the new tea levels that we're coming out. So uh, we will be delivering some from this autumn, um, but they've sort of the plan ones that the government's looking to push through over the next two or two, three years. So some key, some key areas there that will, um, will be there for us. We will be offering these ones from uh, September 2020. Um, some of the key areas, obviously, there's some issues with after COVID around adult nursing and uh, and early years and stuff. So, so some sort of areas that the government wants to focus on through from that as well. But really, it's about ensuring that employers understand that these young people will be of an A-level standard in terms of th that level of engagement. Uh, so, for real rigorous education. Uh, and assessment for these young people. What is key will be the industry placement. This isn't work experience. I think people's perception of work experience in the past is just having somebody come in for a couple of weeks, helping hands, whereas an industry placement will have somebody 45 days a week. That could be, uh, sorry, 45 days a year. That could be a block training or it could be one day a week, for example. So businesses can really think about how they could do some project planning, um, you know, getting that young person really involved with some of the sort of key aspects of that business. And the industry placement needs to be aligned to that young person's qualification. So if they're going to do something in digital coding, then that, that work placement needs to be about digital co uh, coding. Um, and then just some real key points around that, around obviously ensuring uh, it's, it's, it's properly recruited for the, the, the colleges, building reputation within the communities for businesses as well um, and just some really good things around sort of staff development and satisf uh, staff satisf uh, satisfaction as well. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied there. Um, so that's T-levels. That's coming down from this September. So we'll be working with businesses over the coming months about becoming an industry placement person. So if anyone wants to get involved with that, then um, please let us know and... I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Jonathan. That's great. And uh, we can share those slides, can we? Yeah, I'll send them yeah. around to everyone. Marvellous. And then likewise, we do the, the same the, the same thing with um, the, the chamber as well. So, OK, that's great. Um, bear me a second. So, um, yeah, any, any particular questions to Jonathan before we wrap up this part of the session? Well, thank you, Jonathan. You covered uh, that. Sorry, I have one. Um, just yeah. Jonathan, who is the person that uh, say a business was interested in this? Who should the person contact? In the first the instance, college? yeah, in the first instance, if they just come through myself and then I'll funnel that through. Um, we just have an internal change of who's going to head up T levels in terms of that external recruitment. So as soon as I've got that named person, I'll, I'll forward that on. But in the meantime, if anyone comes through myself, we're going to be doing a lot of network activities over the coming months anyway. So and I think that majority would be myself and that new person pushing that through. And if I, if I may just jump in there as well, just yeah, to yeah. say that um, uh, as a chamber as well, we do have a, uh, a website that I would like to signpost you to as well. So you are able to go through that. I'll put that uh, website address in the chat so you can come through, register your interest and we can also signpost. And we're working in, in partnership with Jonathan in delivering a, a whole wraparound as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have one dedicated person dealing with it. Um, and delighted to say that we've actually now um, had accepted as a chamber 677 placements, I knew, yeah, I knew it was um, about that. Uh, which is about 250 businesses. Um, so, yeah, uh, delighted to be able to share that with you as well. But I'll put in the uh, chat the and signpost you to the website, which gives you a bit more intelligence on it. And uh, for, for those uh, listening, uh, Neil, can you just say who you are and just for the yeah, of course, yeah. Oh, no, just for the <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I've been in, I've yeah. been in the background with a blank screen for a while, uh, just with other meetings. My name is Neil Vanstone. I head up uh, membership and events here at the Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce. Um, Ray uh, often asks uh, and invites me to this group uh, to chat with you, so it's lovely to be amongst you. Uh, I'm not always able to attend, but uh, I, myself and my team are able to facilitate this uh, virtual form. So, uh, but yeah, I've been dipping in and out and listening to some of you and uh, Daniel in particular, I was with 
uh, I was on the call listening to you as well. And um, we're, we're obviously doing everything we possibly can as a chamber to, to lobby parliament in terms of uh, the hospitality sector. And in particular, and we do really do understand your pain. But again, just uh, as Ray said, um, you know, we do have a COVID-19 helpline, which again, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to. Um, and again, we're doing everything we possibly can for you.